Welcome back to the Darbar Hall at the 14th Jaipur Literature Festival protected by Ditol. It is our pleasure to present our man Richard Holbrook and the end of the American century George Packer in conversation with Basharat Peer. Journalist and writer George Packer's Our Man Richard Holbrook and the End of the American Century is an enduring account of the force behind the Dayton Accords which famously ended the Balkan Wars. Packer's sweeping diplomatic history is based on Holbrook's diaries and papers and gives a peek into the life of the man both equally admired and detested. Packer's other works include The Unwinding, An Inner History of the New America, The Assassin's Gate, America in Iraq and Blood of the Liberals. In conversation with journalist and writer Basharat Peer, Packer dives into the life and career of an extraordinary and deeply flawed man and the political and social circles he inhabited. George Packer is a staff writer for The Atlantic and the author of Our Man Richard Holbrook and The End of the American Century. He has published five other works of non-fiction including The Unwinding and Inner History of the New America as well as two novels and a play. Basharat Peer is an opinion editor at the New York Times. He is the author of A Question of Order, India, Turkey and the Return of Strong Men. His memoir, Curfewed Night, won India's Crossword Award for Nonfiction and was chosen as a book of the year by both The New Yorker and The Economist. He wrote the screenplay for Heather, an adaptation of Hamlet set in the conflict in Kashmir. Please do remember to comment by typing it in the comment section. Ladies and gentlemen, we now present our man Richard Holbrook and the end of the American century, George Packer in conversation with Basharat Peer. Over to you, Basharat. Thanks, Neha. Welcome, George. Uh, pleasure to see you here again after a long time. And uh, very excited to be talking about uh, your whole book biography, Our Man. It is an, it's an unusual book in the sense that it's not like the traditional biography is. Uh, but I, when I was reading it, I, I felt it, I was, it was more like there were bits of, there were echoes of the new journalism, of the, you know, kind of what it takes uh, and, mm. and other, you know, major political books of that time. It, it really was like, yes, how do you capture a man like Holbrook with, with an outsized pers personality, all his qualities and flaws, uh, a truly like a, remarkable achievement, kind of a non-fiction novel, uh, which also gives us like a big picture world history. I was really struck by the opening, you know, you talk about Holbrook and you say, I knew him and that voice. And I heard you write or say somewhere that in a way you wanted that voice to be this intimate, but voice voice, almost like Marlowe. In, in Conrad. So mm. would you give our readers a sense of the voice? Would you read a bit from the book and then we can talk about the process and the man? Thanks, Basharat. And it's really wonderful to be with uh, the Jaipur Literature Festival and with you today. Um, I'll read the first paragraph of Our Man. Holbrook, yes, I knew him. I can't get his voice out of my head. I still hear it saying, you haven't read that book, you really need to read it. Saying, I feel and I hope this doesn't sound too self-satisfied that in a very difficult situation where nobody has the answer, I at least know what the overall questions and moving parts are. Saying, gotta go, Hillary's on the line. That voice, calm, nasal, a trace of older New York, a sing-song cadence when he was being playful, but always doing something to you, cajoling, flattering, bullying, seducing, needling, analyzing, one-upping you, applying continuous pressure like a strong underwater current so that by the end of a conversation, even two minutes on the phone, you found yourself far out from where you'd started, unsure how you got there and mysteriously exhausted. When I wrote that paragraph, I felt that I had unlocked the, the problem of how to write this story. And the problem was, 
a biography is a huge burden. You have this life, you have all these documents, you have, in my case, 250 people to interview. And the last thing you want to do is force your reader on a long march through the story that you yourself have been uh, acquiring through research and interviews because it's boring. I, don't, I didn't want people to have to hear what Holbrook studied in high school or who his best friends were. Um, and the voice of the narrator gave me the freedom to do exactly as I pleased. That voice is not quite mine. The narrator is someone a bit different. I was thinking about Conrad and Marlowe. I was thinking about maybe someone older than me who really did know Holbrook as I didn't know him very well. I did know him, but not well, not as well as the narrator. If I had a narrator who was wise enough and experienced enough to tell you the whole story of Holbrook as if he had just seen it his whole life, lived it somehow without your knowing quite how, it would bring the reader in, in an intimate way. And it would also liberate me to tell the story as I wanted. So for example, the first chapter begins, do you mind if we hurry through the early years? That was my way of saying, let's not belabor this and do what most biographies do and take you from age one, two, three, four, five. I don't think there's much to be gained by that. So both being liberating and creative and also um, giving me a way to tell his story with a kind of a, an edge, with an attitude. My narrator has all sorts of opinions about Holbrook and about foreign policy and about America and about the world. I wanted the freedom to put all of that in the book without having to be that neutral, gray, uh, impersonal narrator that most biographies have. Right. I mean, that was, that is really quite striking. And I, I, I personally enjoyed that a lot. But while you do rush through the nursery years and the early years, we do get slices of early biography. I mean, you know, the world as the world knows Richard Holbrook. Like, I mean, he's not, I mean, he's one of the most kind of famous and kind of both loud and detested kind of American diplomats on the kind of broader scene in the last 40, 50 years. I mean, especially... Yes how he kind of through sheer acts of will entered the, you know, played a big role in ending the war in Bosnia, the date on the cards, that's kind of his crowning glory at the moment. But the man was a man of greater ambition. And yeah, yet, just how, how did he become that man? Do we start mm -hmm. from the beginning? Because there's, there's, there's the personal history, uh, which was hidden for a long time which most people didn't know. When I knew of Hol read of Holbrook first, I had no idea. Yeah. He was a child of... I'll let you tell the story. Yeah. He never talked about his past. He didn't... He acted as if he had no family. I mean, like he was self-created. But his parents were refugees from Europe. His mother was a Jewish refugee from Hitler. His father was a Jewish refugee from Stalin. They met in New York City in 1941 uh, or 1940, uh, I guess, uh, the year before Holbrook was born. And he was born in 1941, the year America entered World War II. And the year I think America became a global power by entering the war. So in a sense, Holbrook's life beginning in 41 and ending in 2010, when he died quite dramatically, uh, his life ended in a way that was um, equal to the drama in which he lived it. Um, that span is what I think of as the American century when the United States uh, set the, in, the rules of the international order, enforced them or failed to enforce them, violated them, but was the, the country that every other country had to contend with. And I think that began to end around the time Holbrook died in, in 2010. So the frame of the book is the American century. Holbrook was a diplomat and his career spanned every democratic president from John F. Kennedy to Barack Obama. Um, his career began in Vietnam where he served as a young 
foreign service officer, but more like an aid worker and even a counterinsurgency worker in a very hot Viet Cong dominated province of the Mekong Delta in 1963. So the first part of the book tells that story of Holbrook coming of age in Vietnam and learning the hard way, the limits of American power and the limits of the wisdom of the American government, which he grew up um, taking for granted. Uh, so that's the, the beginning. And his career reached its peak, as you said, Bashra, in Bosnia, where he, this was sort of the peak also, I think, of American post-Cold War power, where America imposed its will on an intractable civil war in the Balkans that the European countries had been unable to end. America ended it, Holbrook more than anyone, at the Dayton Accords. And his life and career ended with Afghanistan. He uh, was... Special yeah. envoy to Afghanistan while President and, Obama was in office. Exactly. And that was in some ways his great failure, uh, both personally and professionally. And I think in some ways it, it literally broke his heart. I mean, it, it really does seem so. But I, I want to take you back to this moment. I mean, you know, most readers of your work and people who are familiar with Holbrook know the kind of art. There was, if we look at three chapters or the three defining moments, it's these three wars. And in a way, it's you, you, you through his journey as, this, as an important policy player in these three wars. I mean, not so much in the Vietnam War, but what was the core lesson that he, I mean, Vietnam for that generation was a defining experience. For America, it changed a lot. Yeah. So he, got, he goes and he's in this plan to build these protected villages, strategic hamlets, as they call them which the French had tried, tr tried before the Americans, but it doesn't quite work out. That, 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 that nation building, what we heard again in Afghanistan after the surge, it was, you know, when coin was, counterinsurgency was suddenly the hottest phrase every wonk in DC was throwing at you. Uh, so what was the core thing that Holbrook took away from that experience as he went into greater roles in other administrations? Yeah, in a way, Afghanistan for Holbrook was like the ghost of Vietnam returning, where every everything he had seen in Vietnam came back in Afghanistan. In but Vietnam, it, yeah, and I, I would came back to him in Afghanistan. But yeah, let's go back to the yeah to start in Vietnam. I I think it took it took a full four years for this very young man who had grown up just assuming America was both strong and good. That right. was the post-World War II belief of his generation. Uh, and they had some evidence for it. The Marshall Plan, the Berlin Airlift, there were reasons to think America was a force for good in the world. It took him four years to realize, first of all, that our tactics in Vietnam were failing, strategic hamlets, air power, firepower in these little villages they were turning farmers into enemies because we were killing civilians. Then that our strategy was wrong, that putting in 500,000 American troops uh, was an occupation, not a war of liberation. And finally, that we could not win the war. And that's when he wrote a very powerful memo in 1967, age 26, wow. to Lyndon Johnson, arguing why this could not work. He has a great line in it where he says, the, the North Vietnamese used time the way the Russians used space during Napoleon's invasion. They, they will wait us out. They know that we will leave and they will still be there. And so they wait until we have fought ourselves out and our country has turned against this war. He explained all that and thought and said, now we need to negotiate with the North Vietnamese. And I think the lesson he learned was one, always be willing to talk to the enemy. That was his key insight in Afghanistan. We need to talk to the Taliban. We will not defeat them on the battlefield. And another was don't believe reports. Reports lie. The government lies to itself all the time. The incentives for lower people to tell higher people what they want to hear are so great. 
that you have to be skeptical of everything. And in fact, he always wanted to see for himself. He had a he wanted to be a journalist at the start of his career and and never really stopped wanting to be a journalist and was a kind of journalist as a diplomat, always wanting to see for himself to talk to people at the lowest level who were experiencing the war on the ground firsthand. But one lesson he did not learn was to doubt America in a fundamental way. Many diplomats and others of his generation came out of Vietnam thinking, we are a deeply flawed nation and our main goal must be to do no harm. That was not Holbrook's view. He came out of the war. continued with the post-war idea of, look, we might have our feelings, but on balance, we are still a force for good. And the world needs us. Problems will not be solved. If there's a refugee crisis, we will need to be there. If there's a civil war, we will need to be there. If there's a flood in Pakistan, we will need to be there. So he had um, a benign view of American power, but he was skeptical of the human beings, the government officials right. who were carrying it out, and rightly so. So when he goes, so he gets, understands these lessons, it's, it's a great education for a young policymaker. I mean, you know, the cost of that war was terrible for the Vietnamese and for Americans. Where does he go after that? What is, what he's driven, he's still a believer. What does he set out to achieve after? Yeah. What is his next summit, the, the peak he has to scale? Well, the first thing he does is he divorces his wife and- um, Well, that's a tough one. So, and he becomes sort of a bad, a bad absent father to his two sons. And that's important. The book is a very personal picture of this man because it's the man in full and everything in his public life is somehow connected to personal. his private life and vice versa. He then becomes Jimmy Carter's uh, assistant secretary of state for Asia during a really important period after the Vietnam War when America's trying to regain some credibility in the world and Holbrook was part of the effort to normalize relations with the People's Republic of China. So that was the big event of those years and he was heavily involved in it. But he also learned the art of bureaucratic war. Uh, he got into a real death match with Zbigniew Brzezinski, Carter's national security advisor. And for the rest of his life, Holbrook was always fighting one of his colleagues or another, and many of them came to hate him because he was so aggressive and so confident and in some ways so good that they just couldn't stand him. Um, and he made enemies all over the place, and many of them came back to haunt him and to upend his ambition. So he, his goal all his life was to be Secretary of State. He never got there, and the reason was himself. He got in his own way again and again. Right, but that period when he's in the Carter administration, of course, he does not. I mean, he learns his lessons. There's somebody who, you know, there's a more there's a veteran diplomat who really outsmarts him in the China, on the you know America and China story. But he did have a big role in America's in in the Carter administration's relationship with. Uh, President Suharto of Indonesia, as the Indonesian forces were occupying East Timor and Americans yeah. were supplying the, under Holbrook's watch, were supplying in Indonesians the low-flying planes. And there's been a lot of criticism of yeah. Holbrook on, look, you, one third of the East Timorese population was killed. You, for all your talk of idealism and being a man who's a force for good, you let that happen and you let them kill yeah. them. So you. You know, that's his critic saying, I haven't really personally investigated that story or researched that. But what did you find in the course of your research when it comes, because some of the strongest criticism of Holbrook comes on the Iraq sanctions during the Clinton regime and then the East Timor episode. How did you, what did you find there? Well, on Iraq, Holbrook didn't have much to do with sanctions on Iraq. He had no Middle East uh, portfolio, and he also, all his life, avoided the Middle East. He saw it as a tar pit right. that he would not benefit from personally or professionally. Wow. 
But when he was assistant secretary for East Asia, you're absolutely right to point to Indonesia and East Timor. And you could also add the Philippines right. and South Korea. Oh, yes. The three, Philippines, yes. you spent uh, on the yard with Marcos and like spent he, a whole day charming them. He the negotiated Marcos. the renewal of leases on uh, air and naval bases in the Philippines. And he also was the point man for the South Koreans during the Kwangju massacre of 1980. So yeah. Holbrook was a humanitarian when it came to refugees and when it came to innocent victims of either natural disasters or war. Right. But when it came to national interests as he saw it mm -hmm. and to human rights, which is from country to country, he was kind of a hawk. He wanted to assert his and America's willingness to deal with unsavory regimes in order to show, and this was very much about domestic politics, that the Democrats could be just as tough as the Republicans because all his career and his generation of Democrats, they carried the burden of Vietnam. Right. And the burden they carried at home was not that they had helped get into the war, but they had wanted to get out of the war. And so the that, Republicans always went after them as being weak and sissies on national security. Exactly. So Holbrook, really to keep his own career afloat, I, and I don't know what his true feelings about Indonesia were. My guess is he didn't think very hard about it. Did you talk to but, him about it? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry? Did you have a kind of personal conversation with him about it at some point? He died in 2010, and I only began the book after his uh, death in no, 2011. You knew him, so yeah. maybe kind of- Yeah, uh, before that, we were all about Afghanistan um, yeah. because I wrote about him- No, I remember the, the last mission. New Yorker. Yeah. The New Yorker. But it was all about Afghanistan and Vietnam, really. So he took human rights with a kind of a cynical, let's not pay too much attention. He gave himself credit mm -hmm. for forcing uh, President Park of South Korea and President Marcos of the Philippines to release important political prisoners. And for him, that was the exchange for allowing human rights violations to happen without serious American uh, reactions. And so you can fault him very much for being a kind of Kissinger realist about these things. And because I think unlike Kissinger, he actually did care about human rights. Uh, he did care. He did see the human factor in foreign policy. He saw it very deeply, in fact. But as a young rising official in the U.S. government, I think he felt he couldn't afford to allow human rights to uh, to drive his. Yeah, just a way of his. Yeah. I, I, so the, the ambition was there and he was kind of. Sure, even if he would have understood, like, look, this East Timor policy is getting a lot of people killed, but he was not then at that point in the position to take those. He didn't want to take those calls. Yeah, he, maybe he, so later in life when he was kind of older, say we go to the kind of Soviet Union has fallen. Yeah. You, know, you have the war in Bosnia, Sarajevo, the, you know, Susan Sontag is writing about it. Everyone is. You know, all the major this is and this is a war in Europe. Uh, can Europe. we go back to can we go back to the 70s for one more second? Oh, sure, Ashra? Sure, of course. Of course. Cambodia is a really interesting case. So during the Carter years, what a million and a half, two million Cambodians were killed by the Khmer Rouge. Right. Holbrook was the first US official to speak out against the genocide, and that was in congressional testimony. So he Unlike Carter, who really didn't pay attention, most people by then were tired of Southeast Asia, did not want to hear about it. The war had been a, a terrible experience at home as well. And Holbrook called attention to it. But then when it came to whether the Khmer Rouge or the Vietnamese puppet regime in Phnom Penh should get the seat at the United Nations for Cambodia, right. Holbrook urged that the Khmer Rouge get it entirely for national interest reasons. So again, that what conflict between, I'm sorry? And what was his main argument there? That all of, our, all of our allies in the region 
right. were uh, hostile to the Vietnamese regime in Cambodia and to the and to Vietnam itself. Um, and we were trying to make curry favor with China and their ally was the Khmer Rouge. And we were in a cold war with the Soviet Union and their ally was in H Hanoi and Phnom Penh. So basically it was cold war politics drove the decision. But when refugees began pouring across the border into Thailand, or when Vietnamese refugees began taking to the South China Sea in flimsy boats, it was Holbrook the, the who pushed hard. Phrase, the boat people. Yeah, Holbrook was the one who pushed hard for Jimmy Carter to open up the doors of the United States to Southeast Asian refugees. So th here's where you see this real conflict between his humanitarian impulses and his ambition. And Really yeah, and exactly. Yeah. So no, go is, ahead with actually, I mean, and those are both truths about the man. I mean, you know. Yes. Yeah. And then he, from there, like the big moment in his life, really, is in between he goes off and he's like, he started foreign policy, the magazine. Yeah, that was it's in the early 70s. Yeah. He, he never really gave up that ambition to be the journalist. So he did actually set, establish for him. He was its founding editor and did that for a while. And then later on, he goes back to the government. And yeah. he had a good relationship with President Clinton, I guess. They didn't really know each other at the start. And Clinton didn't give him a job at ah. the beginning of his administration. And the reason was not because of anything Clinton felt but because Holbrook by then had made enough enemies who were in Clinton's inner circle. Right. The most important one was Anthony Lake, Holbrook's best friend in Vietnam. But they had a falling out over something quite personal, which readers will have to read the book to learn about. And by 1992, they hated each other. And Lake, unfortunately for Holbrook, was Clinton's top foreign policy advisor, became his national security advisor. There's no way Holbrook was going to get into the inner circle because he had made too many enemies. But eventually they had to come back to him because he was too good to leave out. And he became ambassador to Germany. And then when the Bosnian War seemed to be an endless and unsolvable disaster, um, Clinton brought him back to Washington to become the Assistant Secretary of State for Europe. So he's at the same level, Assistant Secretary of State, that he was at. He was the administration. Yeah, he's not going up bureaucratically. And he never got higher than that. But he was in an important job and he made the most of it because where everyone else was wringing their hands and scratching their heads and trying to look the other way, Holbrook pushed and pushed and pushed until Clinton was willing to commit himself to a strategy to get involved in the Bosnian war, to use American air power and to use Holbrook as the negotiator between the three sides in order to try to bring the war to an end. And this was all, Holbrook was doing this, you know, in a really personal way. He had gone to refugee camps as a private citizen. He uh, insisted on getting into Sarajevo when it was quite dangerous. Three of his uh, colleagues died on the mountain road getting in and Holbrook was in that convoy and it was one of the tragic moments of his life. But Holbrook, this is him at his best. He was so obnoxious. He was so pushy and aggressive, but he, that, a, was exactly, that was exactly what was needed to stand up to Slobodan Milosevic and, and end that war. Someone it, as it, difficult as a Holbrook. great story you tell about a restaurant and napkins. Uh, so uh, you know, could you could you tell yeah. you know the the rivers I still use readers you know and forgets. Uh, so Holbrook Holbrook summoned the three warring parties, the Croats, the Bosnians, and the Serbs to a, a U.S. Air Force base in Ohio, in Dayton, Ohio. Now, why Dayton, Ohio? Why not Paris? Why not Geneva? Because Holbrook knew about Paris. He had been in the Paris peace talks with the North Vietnamese in 1968. And what he saw was no one wanted to leave. It was too good being in Paris. They talked and talked or refused to talk and nothing ever happened. He thought if we can get these three along with the European countries on an Air Force base that everyone will want to leave, 
and give them three weeks, like on a, on a stage play. I see it as like a play by Beckett where there's almost no set. Everything is very stark. There's just a few characters. They're trapped with each other psychologically. And right. Holbrook, Holbrook is the producer who has brought them to this stage. Yeah. They have no alternative but to talk to each other until they can find a way to get out. And at the restaurant, this was like the officer's club at the Air Force Base. Holbrook was sitting with um, the uh, one of the Bosnian leaders, the prime minister, and Milosevic was there. And Holbrook got Milosevic and this Bosnian, Haris Salajic, to go back and forth from table to table, writing drawing on a napkin, a cocktail napkin, a map of how they could divide Bosnia uh, and how they would agree to. And eventually they had little villages on it and even a mosque. Uh, which side of the mosque is that line going to be on? And right. that, that was a moment when he realized that he was getting somewhere and that if they would just talk to each other and be forced to, like, and there were so many moments when it was about to collapse and everyone was about to go home. And that was his... Yes, it was really Milosevic, the Serb leader, who brought the the peace to fruition because he couldn't afford for the war to go on. The Bosnians, by that time, felt they could keep fighting. They were doing better in the war. Mm -hmm. It was the Serbs who wanted it to end, and Holbrook knew that, and it was Milosevic who was willing to pretty much sell out every one of his comrades in Bosnia in exchange for a peace deal, which is what happened. It's not a great peace. I've been to Bosnia a couple of times. It's a broken country. It's basically two countries forced to be together in one country and nothing works. That was the structure of Dayton. One but Serbs died. Killing, you, know, you can get like... The killing ended. And that's Holbrook's great achievement. Yeah. And what, after that, like the big... As you, you know, I, I remember reading the piece, you kind of driving down Lahore in this convoy and you were with him and you wrote for the New Yorker when he was appointed the envoy. That's the last great war. At this time, Obama is the president, but he doesn't like him. Yet, no. how does he then become like Obama's man to try to negotiate with the Taliban and the war in Afghanistan? And how did that story pan out? We are, we are now with Khalilzad leading the negotiations from the American side. I mean, one good thing the Trump administration did is they were like, we need to talk and end yes. this war. Uh, yes, which, which Obama did not really see. O Holbrook got a job under Obama entirely because of Hillary Clinton, who was a close friend of Holbrook's and who really admired and loved him and needed him because Holbrook was kind of her advisor on foreign policy. Um, when she became Secretary of State, she got a job for Holbrook as special representative to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Right. And he also wanted India thrown into the deal. But the Indian and uh, The Indian yeah. government, had it almost had a stroke over this. It was basically, you are not going to be negotiating Kashmir uh, between us and the Pakistanis. Exactly. So Holbrook's arrogance and his sense that I, he was like an empire builder. He wanted everything from India to Iran and all the problems in between. Um, and by this point in his life, Basharat, he was not the same man who had negotiated the, the date. date. And America was not the same country. And Obama was not the same president. Obama not only didn't like Holbrook, he despised him. I was just reading Obama's new autobiography, which is a wonderful book. And I looked up Holbrook. He gets half a sentence in 800 pages of Obama's first term. Um, it tells you how Obama really felt. And why did he despise him? Because Holbrook was everything Obama wasn't. Right. Loud, pompous, um, a big personality, older and lecturing Obama a lot, as well as flattering Obama. All the things that anyone with some self-awareness would know you don't do with Obama. Holbrook, his tragic flaw was he did not know himself. He had no self-awareness. Mm -hmm. And this... 
I think, was what got him into so much trouble. He couldn't understand why Obama seemed to dislike him so much. And he kept trying harder and harder to, to win his trust. And the harder he tried, the less Obama liked him until Obama was telling his aides, I don't want to be in the same room with this guy. There's almost a physical revulsion toward Holbrook. So Holbrook was humiliated in those two years. Was he, uh, he, was he yeah. to, uh, the, the important question here is, was he able to at least drill in the idea that we need to talk to the Taliban, which you're at war with? Yeah. I mean, that he, idea he, was picked up later, but was he the main proponent of that idea? Because Obama wasn't really. He was the main uh, proponent, but most of the government was against it. The White House uh, was suspicious of it because they were afraid they might be called soft on terrorism, that they might get tricked by the Taliban. They were also being pushed hard by the military to give war a chance, to give the surge a chance. And we can't talk to these guys until we've beaten them down on the battlefield. That was David Petraeus's view. The CIA was against it. Hillary Clinton really wasn't for it either. And she was Holbrook's boss. Holbrook didn't have any room. He had no leverage. So was, he was quiet. Yeah. So he did prove right, at least even when nobody heard him. His instinct in terms of choosing talks as the way to end the war eventually has turned out to be the only path America had. Absolutely. No, he was right. He was right. And Obama should have listened to him. And it's a tragedy of, for both Afghanistan and the United States that Obama, as brilliant as he was, did not have the, in some ways, the confidence to say, I don't like this man, but I'm going to try to use him for national purposes because he's useful to me. He could be good. Instead, he cut Holbrook out. He left him off trips to Kabul. He humiliated him at meetings uh, in a mild way because Obama's not a cruel man, but everyone around Obama knew that Holbrook was out of favor. And Holbrook was sort of the last one to figure it out. Um, and by the time he figured it out, his friends were all saying, get out, just leave. But Holbrook couldn't leave because he knew he was 69 years old. This was his last chance to be a great man. To what be a great man. the last day? So As the story ends. What, at the very end of his life, he was finally beginning negotiations with the Taliban. Hillary Clinton and Obama had given him the green light to start. So it was very, very late. It was like November, December 2010 that that began. He went into Hillary Clinton's office on December 10th, 2010, to brief her on how the negotiations were going. He had just come from the White House where he'd been trying to get one of Obama's advisors, David Axelrod, to let him have a meeting with Obama where he would explain himself. And no, that he'd been trying this for two years, no meeting. He goes to the State Department into Hillary's office. He's out of breath. He's late. He sits down. He begins to talk to dominate the meeting immediately, as always. And suddenly his face turns this horrible shade of red. And Hillary says, my God, Richard, what's happening to you? And what was happening was his aortic artery had torn and the blood was now flowing into his spinal column and down into his extremities. He didn't know any of this. All he knew was he couldn't feel his legs and he was in terrible pain. So they rushed him to the hospital. The last hour of his conscious life, which I describe in great detail at the end of the book, um, was in some ways Holbrook at his most Holbrook. He's in agony, he's terrified, he's holding the hand of his aide saying, don't let me die here in the ambulance. And it's a powerful, poignant moment. He's also saying, write down what I'm saying. Are you recording my every witticism? Don't have a press conference till after I get out of surgery. Be sure to let the White House know, but, but first be sure to, he's holding a staff meeting while he's dying. And he's also telling him to say, "I tell Les Gelb I love him. Tell my sons. He's sending messages to everybody. He goes into surgery uh, and never comes out um, and never comes out alive. And so his life ended in this really dramatic way in Hillary Clinton's office at the moment when he was beginning talks with the Taliban. That could um, happen. Eventually, and, to the end of the war. 
And my, my assessment is that he was an almost great man. He was not a great man. He didn't achieve what he had hoped. He didn't reach the level, the station he wanted, but he, uh, he, he was in some ways better than many a secretary of state who you've never heard of. Uh, he did more as an assistant secretary than most secretaries of state. But that almost great is very painful because I think it, it, he was aware of that. He knew what he had failed to do as well as what he had achieved to do. And I have this image of his soul being restless after his death because it had never quite arrived. It was well, neither. I, yeah. I think, you know, he, the soul might rest, be at rest now after the book, after your book has come out. He, he I feel would, like he's come. I'm, no, I'm, he's come I'm, after I'm, me. <laughs> Are you sure, Vacheron? I hope you're I'm, right. I'm, well, I think you did justice to the man with all his flaws and strengths. I really enjoyed the book. You see, thank you you see that filing cabinet back there? That, that, that black all, filing uh, cabinet? All the papers? Those were his papers. They're now at Princeton, but for eight years he was in this room like sitting over my desk uh, haunting me. So I, I'm a little more at rest. I hope he's more at rest too. And what is next from you? Is there a new book coming up? Yeah, Maybe I've just tomorrow? finished. Uh, I've just finished a short book that's called "Last Best Hope," and it's really about America and where we have come uh, at the end of the Trump years and and looking forward and backward. And it's a kind of um, uh, a letter to my country saying we have to save ourselves because we we're in a near death experience we're in an existential crisis so it's more of an essay it's not a long essay a work of it's a long essay called last best and when Hope. is it uh, when is it expected to be out june june oh, from for, for our strauss Giroux, yeah thank you so much for your time really this has been wonderful i, I enjoyed it more time to talk about the Unwinding, your book about traveling through America, which is a fascinating book. I love it. But I hope people will read that as well, because the two books, Our Man and the Unwinding, really complement each other. One is, in a way, the way I saw it is looking at America and the world, and the Unwinding is looking at the backyard, at the home front, at what America had become. Well, maybe next year in Jaipur. <laughs> next year, hopefully. Okay. Pleasure. Thank you, George and Basharat, for that very interesting conversation. Thank you so much. We'd like to thank our partners, Diageo, and thank you all for watching and being such a lovely audience. We do hope you will pick up your copy of the book from the Amazon bookstore. And if you're in the mood for some retail therapy, please do check out our merchandise partners, Earth Fables. Do stay logged on to watch with us the series of exciting sessions featuring a stellar list of speakers that have been specially curated for you. We do hope you will contribute in whatever capacity to us at Teamwork Arts to ensure a seamless flow of knowledge. Please do remember to tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2021 and tag us at Jaipur Lit Fest. The festival is protected by Ditol. Hope to see you soon.